The Dallas Cowboys Legends Show is presented by AT&T, Texas Lottery. Play the Dallas Cowboys scratch ticket today. It's your ticket for a chance to win big. And by NFL Game Pass. You'll never miss a game again. Enjoy full and condensed game replays from week one to the Super Bowl. What, six? This is 12 against uh, Denver. And here's the Super Bowl we lost to Baltimore. When we lost to Pittsburgh in 75, and then we lost Pittsburgh again in 78. This turns out to be a pretty a pretty nice ring, uh, but I'm so glad I still have them. They were dominant, a force of power and precision built like none other. Over a 20-year stretch, from 1966 to 1985, the Dallas Cowboys went to the playoffs 18 times. In building the legacy of America's team, nine players who took the field for the Cowboys during that era are now Pro Football Hall of Famers, including Drew Pearson, who was inducted this August. They were giants of the game, superstars, legends. However, championships are also won through the sheer determination of those who, quite simply, know their roles. The grinders who do the dirty work without the accolades without the fanfare, the unsung heroes. D.D. Lewis, he was the very definition of the unsung hero. He wore the star for 13 seasons in 186 games, one of the longest tenures in franchise history. He was never a pro bowler, never an all pro, but only once in his career did he fail to reach the playoffs. He came to work, he did his job, and he did it well. The fiery leader was linebacker D.D. Lewis, number 50, who, like Cole, was never afraid to stick his head into the thick of a sweep. D.D.'s such a great guy. D.D. was a, a locker room uh, peace, peacemaker, peacekeeper, because everybody loved D.D. I mean, he just, he's got this happy spirit about him and great linebacker, too, by the way. I mean, what a tough guy. D.D. D. Lewis, I mean, these guys were just tough players, and they were knowledgeable, and they knew what they were doing. I mean, he never, didn't make mistakes, and he knew the flex, and he knew what he was doing, and Tom liked people who knew how to play his defense. Indeed, Tom Landry did. The iconic head coach once called D.D. D. the most underrated player on the Cowboys, a player who was willing to do anything to get his team to the playoffs even without personal glory. I never uh, realized we had such a great defense until I got out of football. and started looking back at it, you know. Uh, you know, I think my attitude was, well, we won that one, let's get to work on the next one, you know, let's put it together. And, uh, you had to work for it. I mean, it, because everybody was gunning for us. You know, we had Lily, uh, George Andre, uh, Jethro Pugh, and then you had the linebackers. Leroy Jordan, Chuck Halley, and Dave Edwards. I mean, they were just, they'd been there for a long time and they knew Landry's defense. So they had me playing every one of the positions, strong, weak, and middle, so. But anyway, that, that's when I started getting to know, realize how good these guys were. The foundation for Dwight Douglas Lewis's tough blue collar work ethic was built growing up in Knoxville, Tennessee. He was the youngest of 14 kids in a poor family that lived in a four bedroom house. Several years ago, Lewis shared his story with the Fayetteville, Tennessee Rotary Club. My mom and dad were busy putting food on the table and clothes on our backs. My dad, he'd get off from work. By the time I came around, he was in the printing business. He'd get off from work, he'd go to the bar, have a few drinks, he'd come home about 11 o'clock. My mother would start in on him and wake everybody up, of course. And the same thing would happen the next morning. My, my house was rough, rowdy, and raucous. And uh, the police were there often. You see, I grew up, my perception of who I was, I was dumb and stupid, white trash. I lived across the tracks, and I was never going to mount to anything. Headed down the wrong path, he was arrested at the age of 13 for stealing a car. After two weeks in jail, he vowed to make a change. I was so alone, it's crying, so afraid. And, uh, you know, I got on my knees and I said my first foxhole prayer. And 
My, everybody knows what a foxhole prayer is. God, if you get me out of this, I'll never do it again. His prayer was indeed answered, and he returned to school. And although he expected to drop out after his freshman year to go to work, just as his brothers and sisters had done, Lewis instead was talked into playing for the high school football team by his cousin. The decision changed his life. You know, I found a home for my aggression. I, I took it off the streets and put it into the athletic arena. And uh, those guys became my surrogate father in so many ways. Dee Dee was a star for Fulton High School in Knoxville earning All-State recognition as a linebacker in 1963. His performance earned him a scholarship to Mississippi State. I didn't think I'd be at Mississippi State two months because they'd find out how dumb and stupid I was and I was too small for college football. And again, the coaches, they just, they, they liked me and uh, I liked that. And they put two tutors on me for school and, and I had a great career at Mississippi State. A two-way starter for the Bulldogs from 1965 to 1967, Dee Dee earned all SEC honors in his final two seasons while playing both linebacker and center and was named the conference's Defensive Player of the Year as a senior. Alabama's legendary head coach Bear Bryant once called him the best linebacker in the country. Despite the accolades, Dee Dee wasn't drafted until the sixth round of the 1968 draft, when the Cowboys took him with the 159th overall pick. This after Dallas had already selected not one, but two linebackers ahead of him. Um, they had two linebackers drafted in front of me, and they were going to keep them and let me go. Well, John got drafted into the Army, and I slid in the back door in 68 and made the team. In 1969, Lewis would receive his own draft call-up and miss the season serving in the Tennessee National Guard in Knoxville. But he would return to the Cowboys in 1970, ready to join a team on the cusp of greatness. I got drafted, uh, but uh, I got in the National Guard back in Knoxville. And, and so I had to go to basic training. So when I came back uh, for training camp the following year, John and I had to battle for the position again. So they sent him off to New York and kept me. Over his first four seasons in the NFL during the first generation of Dallas famed doomsday defense, D.D. D. Lewis had to make his impact primarily on special teams as he continued to learn Tom Landry's intricate flex defense. I had no, uh, no understanding of pro football at all. Uh, the only way I made the team, I just went nuts on the special team. You know, I'd go under the, under the, on the kickoffs, I'd go under the wedge, over the wedge, around the hit wedge, uh, hit people when they weren't looking in the, in the locker, in the, when you're watching films, everybody go, oh, you know, <laughs> so you got Landry's attention somewhat. I always felt like our methods were good and that we were going to be successful and it, it took some time to do it. Flex defense, uh, it would take a middle linebacker two or three years to get uh, acclimated to be able to to call the defenses and, and handle the run. See, the natural reaction for a defensive player is to pursue the football. But you had to hold your ground uh, playing that flex, and everybody had a gap, and middle linebacker had two gaps, and had in run force, and they had force on the backside. But once you got it down, it was an outstanding defense. So the coaches were not co teaching technique so much as teaching you the defense. And what, what the other people are doing on the defense. You know, you need to know what the defensive backs are doing uh, on a certain defense. Uh, just, it, it would improve your game if you did. Mm -hmm. So they were more, uh, they were not teaching techniques, they were teaching football uh, strategy. Dede appeared in 38 of 42 regular season games from 1970 to 1972, but started just two while playing behind future Ring of Honor member Chuck Howley. Landry himself admitted that Lewis could start for anybody. This game was one defined by Tom Landry's rules. If you could operate under Tom Landry's rules and make that work and make it effective, you could play. If you didn't, you'd take the cog out, put another cog in. The flex defense is, is, is fascinating. Tom Landry had, it was a thinking man and he would not um, accept anything about except for the highest uh, intelligence, football intelligence you could get. I was learning the middle and the strong side, and, and basically the weak side was that you contained everything. 
just uh, at certain defenses. You, you, they have to cut it in for the middle linebacker to make the tackle. Didi became the captain on special teams and was a key reserve in the linebacking rotation when the Cowboys lost in Super Bowl V to Baltimore before winning the title the next year against Miami. Once Halley retired in 1973, Didi moved into the starting lineup and would go on to start in 132 of 134 games over the next nine seasons. Giants pick it up and head right. Now there's another fumble. Jay Selby has it. Goes in toward the end zone. Touchdown, Cowboys! It just all uh, kind of clicked. Uh, it took two or three years for it to click for me and understand what it was all about, but especially when Chuck Halley got hurt in, uh, in the 72 season, that's when I got my chance to play. A fresh-faced youngster with the first generation of the Doomsday defense, he became a respected leader of Doomsday's second generation, which began with the famed Dirty Dozen draft of 1975, a draft that included Hall of Fame defensive tackle Randy White, as well as linebackers Bob Brunig and Thomas Hollywood Henderson and safety Randy Hughes. And we had a great base of veterans, you know, Roger Staubach, Leroy Jordan, Dave Edwards, D.D. Lewis, Rayfield Wright, Jethro Pugh. We had so many, uh, you know, great players, core players on that. And uh, I think the young guys that came in, we rejuvenated that group. That emotional factor that the rookies bring into the game, uh, the unpredictable thing that they have, I knew that if we had that going for us, the determination, the intensity, that we could beat anybody. We had a lot of young players influencing us to keep our, our uh, attitude young, young at heart, because we had a great uh, injection of players that season. There were that, that class and what, that attitude we had from that class in 1975 when we drafted Randy and, and Thomas and Bob, and those guys played a huge role for, for years. And I learned a lot from Didi. He was probably six or seven years older than me. So when I came in, he was outside Dave Edwards, Leroy Jordan, Didi Lewis. So I actually, when I started on the strong side and in the middle, Didi was outside linebacker for a few years there. Didi remembered one conversation he had with fellow veteran linebacker Dave Edwards about the influx of young talent. And he says, man, you ought to see this guy they drafted. Thomas Anderson. He said, "You won't believe him. He's oh, he's big. He he he's, he he runs the hundred like nine five or something, you know. And he jumps uh, four feet high, vertical leap. And uh, he's, you know, and I'm sitting there just smiling, you know. And, and I'm thinking, yeah, here's another guy they brought in trying to cut me. God knows what I would have been able to do because I had that that thing." But I never challenged D.D. I had, I had a sort of um, veteran respect for his knowledge, his playing the flex. I just, I was just happy playing special teams with Mike Ditka and, you know, and sitting in meetings confused. We knew we had something special. We knew we were the young guys on the block. And uh, I, I just, just remember having this great sense of confidence. We can beat anybody. I mean, we really can. We can take the field, and if we're on, we can win. And when they did, the Cowboys reached the Super Bowl three times in a span of four years, from 1975 to 1978, winning the championship in 1977 with a dominating 27-10 victory over Denver in Super Bowl XII. The Doomsday defense sacked the Broncos four times, forced eight turnovers, and allowed only 156 total yards of offense. <laughs> There was a drive inside of us that was, and I think you could put that team against, as I said, I put it against any team in the NFL at any time, and uh, I think we would have the same kind of numbers. It was a lot different for me in the 71 Super Bowl and 77 because I was especially teams. And, yeah. And uh, so I didn't have so much to worry about, you know, uh, just get ready to go down on punts, kick off the, all the return teams, that type of stuff. But '77, you know, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a starter. I'm a part of the team. Uh, I mean, we were, we were on them right at the start. Weiss five yards back has the snap. Here comes the rush. He's up in the pocket. 
He is there, he fumbled the ball. There's a chase for it, and the Cowboys have recovered. Dallas has the ball at the 30-yard line. That is the eighth turnover by the Denver Broncos this afternoon. What I remember about that game in the locker room beforehand, just before we went out on the field, I remember sitting at my at my uh, at my bench. Just the whole room was just like you could have heard a pin drop. And Coach Landry came in the room. He walked in the room. He says, "Okay, let's have a good game." And we went out there, and boom, that was it. We had a real good mixture and a good leadership and uh, um, that defined exactly how uh, to demolish teams. I mean, really uh, not let them up for breathing room and all. We had that ability to do that that year. While Super Bowl 12 would be his final championship, Didi would make the playoffs in each of his last four years. Returning to the Super Bowl in 1978, where the Cowboys lost to Pittsburgh. In all, he appeared in 27 postseason games, which is still tied with Peyton Manning for the fifth most in NFL history. Unfortunately, the final game of Didi's career just so happened to be against the 49ers in the 1981 NFC Championship game when quarterback Joe Montana avoided Didi's rush and threw a touchdown pass to Dwight Clark to defeat Dallas 28-27, a play forever known as the catch. He remembered the moment further during his speech to the Fayetteville, Tennessee Rotary Club. In that game, when uh, you may have seen it on the classic uh, ESPN Classics, it's number 19 on their top 25 plays, where Montana rolls out to his right and he throws the ball to Dwight Clark in the end zone. Now, if you ever see that play again, look for old number 50. Slow motion, I am tracing uh, <laughs> Montana. That was my last play. I was getting out of the shower not long ago, and I'm Fine off, and I'm thinking, why did you blitz on that play? <laughs> you know, how many of us have something in our past that we just can't get rid of? You know, Didi was voted the Cowboys' most popular player in his final season, a well-earned acknowledgement of the often unrecognized role he played on a team filled with superstars. But for a man who spent 26 years of his life playing football, retirement wasn't always easy. An acknowledged partier during his days with the Cowboys, he battled addiction soon after leaving the bright lights of the NFL. Most of my life, I, I, I lived on the fence. I lived a double life. On one side, I'm a stand-up Christian athlete, and the other side, I'm crowded in the streets doing very shameful things with the guys, and it almost killed me. Thankfully, Dee Dee was able to climb out of the darkness in the late 1980s, and he's remained sober to this day. He kept grinding, he kept doing the dirty work, this time, however, it wasn't to win a Super Bowl. It was to earn victory for himself, his family, and his faith. And through it all, even today, D.D. D. Lewis still finds it hard to believe the life he's led, coming from the wrong side of the tracks in Tennessee to the pinnacle of success as a Dallas Cowboy, typical of an unsung hero. I did, I just like to say, I was lucky to make the team, you know. And then having to go to the Army uh, for a season, uh, it was just, it was, it, you know, it was meant to be, I guess. Uh, of course, they had a lot of help, you know. The Dallas Cowboys Legends Show was presented by AT&T, Texas Lottery, Play the Dallas Cowboys scratch ticket today. It's your ticket for a chance to win big. And by NFL Game Pass. You'll never miss a game again. Enjoy full and condensed game replays from week one to the Super Bowl.